Hey, how come I can only see files newer than December 3rd? Probably just a visual error. Try to rerunning. I did. I've already tried everything. I don't see any of the research data from the last month. Maybe it's in a different drive. I checked all of them. Our files are gone. Bakara. On December 14th, 2021, Kyoto University staff was hard at work, researching everything from brain signal changes when reading four frame manga to the derivation of 3D nucleosome folding structures by simulated annealing molecular dynamics. Advanced simulations like this requiring trillions of calculations per second aren't going to be run on just any Sony file. You're going to need a supercomputer, which Kyoto University happens to have. A supercomputer isn't just a massive rig with a Ryzen Threadripper Pro. It's thousands of servers or nodes all wired together to crunch numbers in parallel, running a special Linux-based operating system for this purpose. All the nodes need to read and write data at the same time, so that's where Lustre comes in, an open-source parallel file system purpose-built for supercomputers where thousands of nodes need to read and write from it simultaneously. In Kyoto's case, a Lustre file system was mounted at a place called Large Zero. To the researchers, it was a giant shared folder where they saved their projects and datasets over the years. But under the hood, all of this supercomputer stuff ran on racks of servers provided and maintained by, you guessed it, HP Enterprise. HP wasn't just providing the hardware, Kyoto had also outsourced certain file management and backup responsibilities to them. For example, various research applications will inevitably generate a bunch of log files which provide additional information for debugging. However, you don't want a bunch of useless old log files lying around forever, which is why most systems have a way to rotate logs. Old logs can be compressed, archived, and eventually deleted from the system entirely. HP had a housekeeping script for this purpose running on Kyoto's supercomputer, which would periodically run and delete logs older than 10 days. This was a Bash script, which is a programming language used to interact with Unix systems. Bash is what you call a purely interpreted programming language, where each line of the source code is parsed and interpreted at runtime. Alternatively, other programming languages choose to compile the human-readable code directly into machine code which is just the literal zeros and ones only the CPU can understand. This is what compiled languages like C, Go, and Rust do, which are all famous for being pretty fast. However, machine code is platform-dependent, so a C program compiled on Windows will need to be recompiled for Linux. But there's also an in-between. We can make the human-readable code more efficient for computer programs to run, but without making it so efficient that the code can only be run on the system it's compiled on. This is called bytecode. In Java's case, your source code is first compiled and then archived into a jar file. This is the full application converted into a convenient bytecode package. Then, you can run the jar file with a special program called the Java Virtual Machine, a virtual machine that only knows how to interpret Java bytecode. The benefit here is that the JVM abstracts away any operating system or hardware differences, so as long as you install it once, you can run any and all Java bytecode of the same major version, of course. Every programming language falls into these two categories, interpreted or compiled. But the thing being interpreted at runtime is usually bytecode, or some other intermediary structure produced prior to execution. Bash is unique in that it incrementally parses and executes lines of the source code during runtime. It does this just like any other process reads a file. The bash process will create a pointer called the file descriptor aimed at the kernel file table entry, which contains metadata of the open file, such as the current read location called the file offset, and another pointer to the inode table. Inodes basically represent the file itself, containing metadata such as ownership, timestamps, and pointers to where the file's data blocks are stored on disk. And to read a file, all programs ultimately use the Unix syscall read, which returns the bytes requested and increments the file offset accordingly. But because Bash reads directly from source, what happens if the Bash script is changed mid-execution? Well, that depends on whether or not you overwrite the file inode in place. In Linux, the script file's inode will have many things pointing to it, like its directory entry and processes that have the file open. An in-place overwrite means you keep the pointers in place and modify the inode contents. The other way is to prepare a new inode and swap the pointer. For example, suppose we have two scripts, current script and new script. 
If we want to replace current script with a new script, there are two obvious options. You can either MV move or CP copy the new script to replace the current script. In both cases, you end up with current script pointing to updated content, but one of them does an in-place overwrite, while the other performs an atomic swap. Which does which? If you actually know the answer to this, you are a certified Unix master. But before I reveal the answer, what exactly is an atomic swap? The word atom comes from the Greek word atomos, which means indivisible. Back then, you couldn't divide atoms, meaning they couldn't have a partial state. Therefore, for a change to be atomic means it happens without anyone ever seeing a partial state. When I move new script to current script, Linux simply makes the current script directory entry point to the new script's inode. Since there is only one step, there is no partial state. If you check the syscalls of MV, you can see it's just a single rename operation. Furthermore, processes which open the file prior to the swap can still use the old inode. Here it is in action. Using ls-i, we can see the inode numbers of both files. After running MV, the current script has the updated contents, but look at its inode. It's been swapped to the inode number of new script. On the other hand, if I copy new script to current script, the current script's inode is unchanged. It performed an in-place modification of its existing inode. As you can see from the syscalls used in CP, it is not a single step. The existing file is opened, truncated to zero, and then new data is written. So a file can be accessed in a partially written state if you get unlucky with timing. Furthermore, even if nothing accesses the partial file as it's being modified, existing processes that had the file open now observe the new content. Bash, for example, will continue reading the new file from the current position of its file pointer, combining the already parsed parts of the old file stored in memory with whatever new stuff it reads. This will crash most of the time since the offset will not necessarily be located cleanly between commands. But if the transition between the old and new script retains proper syntax, and you get really unlucky, some pretty crazy stuff can happen. Let's take a look at a cleanup script similar to what HP could have used. The script simply finds all files in the log directory older than 10 days and deletes them. Now, HP wants to update the script. They have a new version, and among other changes, the log directory variable was renamed from its previously unintelligible name to something that actually makes sense. Now, it's possible for v1 to run, load the original variable into memory, and then do a bunch of random stuff that takes a while. While this happens, a deployment is performed by HP to CP v2 into v1, modifying the file contents in place. After the random stuff is completed, Bash continues scanning the new lines and begins executing this line. Since the variable for the log directory referenced in the updated script is different from the old variable loaded into memory, Bash declares it is an undefined variable, which by default is an empty string. Now, rather than calling find on the log directory path, it calls find on the root large zero mount, gets all the items, and begins wiping them out of existence. This, however, was not an instantaneous operation. There were tens of millions of files, so depending on your IOPS, a full deletion could easily take hours to days. As the clock ticked on, files slowly vanished from the system at about half a gig per second. Eventually, researchers probably began noticing that their programs were failing due to missing files, and some dashboard somewhere was definitely looking very suspicious. After all of these things came to light, though, it was too late. Nearly two days had passed since the deletion began. By the time it was stopped, 77 terabytes and 34 million files affecting 14 research groups had been deleted. But this was really unlucky, right? What are the chances that HP pushes an update to the script exactly during the time between the variable initialization and deletion? Even a one minute window where updating the script would mess things up is still a mere 0.2% chance of occurrence, assuming everything happens during work hours. But if we look closer at the letter, HP actually calls the script a baku apu sukuriputo, or backup script, meaning that it's probable the script was also doing a bunch of other backup stuff and the log deletion was just a little cherry on top of the much larger job that took a while. In this case, the chance of the overwrite race condition increases dramatically. Fortunately, the backup script 
Fortunately, the backup Sukuriputo was not completely useless, as 49 terabytes of the deleted data was backed up, so only 28 terabytes were lost, causing a mere four departments to permanently lose everything. HP quickly came in and apologized, taking 100% responsibility for the incident and provided compensation in line with the wishes of the affected users. So obviously, the issue would never have happened if the script update was deployed using a method that doesn't modify the inode in place, such as MV. If you prefer copying over moving, there is a CP flag called remove destination, which will unlink the old inode so that existing processes can continue to read from it and create a brand new inode for the new file content. However, please note that neither of these are fully atomic across different file systems. So if you want something that's absolutely safe, you can always write the new script to a temporary file in the same file system or folder, and then do the rename. On the bash side, there are various flags you can set, such as the U flag, which causes the program to error out when there are unset variables, rather than interpreting them as empty strings. Alternatively, you can try to use a safer language like Python or Microsoft PowerShell, in the end, Kyoto University still stands strong as the number one university in Kyoto and is aiming for the gold medal at the International Synthetic Biology Competition, which has the final judging coming up in a few days. Best of luck to them, and always remember, set EUO pipe fail because Bash will take every opportunity it can to delete your computer.